Hey students, still feeling a little bit under the weather, so we're going to have a video lecture today. Hope you don't mind. It should be tons of fun. All right, today we're going to talk a little bit about acting, both inside out and outside in acting, and we'll find a little bit of time to go over the acting projects. Now, I'll uh, continue to go over that in class on Thursday. Hopefully, I'll feel well enough to come back to class, but uh, here, here's hoping at least. So your book breaks acting down into two different ways. One is inside out and the other is outside in. We're gonna cover both of them, but first I think we're gonna do a little bit of a history on the development of the actor. Now we already touched on this a little bit when we discussed Greek and uh, Roman theater. And if you watch my video lecture on Roman theater, medieval theater and all that jazz, we talked about actors. Uh, in that time period. But just to review, during the Greek times, actors were exclusively male and wore masks. Same in the Roman times. And for female parts, they would always be played by men in women's dresses, so cross-dressed roles. Um, Shakespeare's time, that tradition continued. Remember, we talked about boy companies. So you'd have pre and boys or young boys playing roles like adult women like Lady Macbeth, like Cleopatra. So some of these big meaty roles were played by, uh, you know, boys under 13, probably. And though we haven't touched on Asia in this course yet, if we jump over to Asia for roles in the no theater and roles in eventually in the Kabuki theater also were played by cross-dressing men. So you have sort of a male heavy <laughs> origin to the profession of acting. However, that all changes when actresses grace the scene. So if we go to Western Europe, the first time that actresses are on the scene is really in the medieval times. Uh, women start to perform uh, in public in big spectacles here. The Commedia dell'arte time period, which is during the Italian Renaissance, is one where you have women uh, as full members of acting companies that are uh, professional actresses that draw people in to the crowd uh, with their acting skills and talents and have roles specifically written for them, both by male playwrights and by female playwrights. This further develops in Spain during the Spanish golden age. Uh, the dates are down there. They're not too important, but just to realize it's, it's basically the Renaissance time period after 1550s in Europe uh, and in the Golden Age Spain, women could perform, but had some restrictions. Uh, for example, uh, they had to have a member of their family in the company. I think you either had to be married to someone in the acting company or the child of someone in the acting company. So you sort of had to be in a family group there. And also if a woman was on stage playing a man or cross-dressing in any way, she couldn't fully cross-dress in Spain. She had to only cross-dress from the top uh, the bottom had to still be fe traditional female clothes. Don't know why that was, but that was the law. That was the requirement of the Spanish Golden Age theater. So though we see women coming into the forefront and coming onto the stage, there still were restrictions on them. It wasn't just like today where you could you know, perform uh, wherever you'd like. Now you still had to have someone sort of some sort of male sponsorship sort of for the actress in the, um, in the company. However, that doesn't mean that women didn't have agency and have power and have economic power uh, in terms of uh, performance, which was a new thing uh, for the world uh, in general. Uh, let's take a look at one particular example of that, Isabella Andrini. Uh, perhaps she's the first superstar actress. So her dates were here towards the middle of the 1500s in Italy, firmly in the Italian Renaissance. And she is known as a playwright, a poet, an actress in the Commedia dell'arte tradition. And by the way, she also had eight kids and still performed at the same time. Toured Europe, kings, queens, dukes invited them for their birthday parties. Have Andrini's troupe come over here and oh yeah, we really want it. She's a fantastic performer. She's a fantastic artist. Let's have her perform. That's great. She was in demand a superstar, if you will. And because she was sort of above reproach, married to someone in the in the company, uh, performed well, uh, what held herself to a high standard, both on stage and off, that she was not associated with any sort of um, 
uh, people of ill repute or anything like that. She elevated it. She sort of proved that, hey, women could be on stage in respectable positions while doing comedy, by the way, sometimes body comedy, uh, make money for themselves, write, read, and be accepted by a, a primarily male-dominated society. Um, so in that sense, she sort of paved the way as the first superstar actress in Europe. Um, now, we maybe a contrast to this is uh, when we go over to Kabuki and we see the priestess who started uh, the entire genre of Kabuki theater, maybe is somewhat of the uh, the equivalent of it, Isabella Andrini, but they're focused in Western Europe right now. She's sort of the first. She breaks the mold. So acting in general, acting in general. Your book talks about acting, and later on when we, in the second part of the semester, when we talk about design, we'll also go back to this concept. So this is one of the core concepts of our book and of our program in Intro to Theater. But your book describes acting in two different styles. One is presentational style, presentational style, where you have no attempt to imitate real life. So you're acting not in a realistic manner, something that's not realistic. In contrast to that, we have representational style. Your book defines that as realistic, an attempt to imitate reality uh, in some way, shape, or form. So presentational, representational acting. Now, we're probably more familiar with representational acting through film and TV, the, the majority of that, even if you're in a fantasy setting, like even in Game of Thrones land, where you have magic and dragons and all that other stuff, the actors are still fundamentally attempting to imitate reality. How would somebody react in that situation to, uh, you know, some big scary dragon popping out of the corner or something? So that's fantastical. There's no dragons in the world. There's no white walker zombies in the world. But how would somebody realistically react to that? Would still put that acting style, I would say, firmly in the representational side of things. On stage two, American, uh, American plays generally, the acting style is still uh, representational here. So a good way to remember that is the P from presentational is pretend not realistic, pretend. And the R from representational is real, realistic. So think P pretend, R real, yeah? Let's try a little example here. Get your uh, eyeglasses on here. <laughs> so take a look at this image for a second. And <laughs> though it's an image, we don't see people moving or speaking or gesturing. Just as a guess, would you say these two performers are attempting a representational uh, performance or a presentational performance, would you say? If you said presentational, remember pretend, not realistic, presentational, ding, 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 you got that right. I would say more likely than not, these actors are attempting a presentational performance. One more time. How about this scene? Once again, it's just a still image, right? Just a photograph. But is this more of a representational acting style or presentational acting style? Yeah, if you said representational, remember R for real, looks realistic, then that uh, would be correct. I think uh, it's most likely that these actors are attempting to perform a representational style of acting. Now, that leads us to how these actors are performing. Let's look at the three tools of the actor. Three tools of the actor. Let's start with on the left side of the screen here, the body. One of the tools of the actor is the body. How the body moves is one of the foremost ways that we have of communicating non-verbally with each other in life. And the same thing is true on the stage. The actor may be trained in dance, in advanced relaxation techniques or meditation techniques uh, or some sort of specialty movement like combat or all body training things for an actor. The other tool of the actor is the voice. And the voice is used <clears throat> to communicate the text that the playwright writes down, right? Our dialogue, um, which we discussed before, but also can be used for projection. If you think back to ancient Greece, and 14,000 people and you were outside, you probably needed to project your voice loudly in order to be heard in the very back uh, of, of those big Roman uh, or uh, Greek outdoor theaters. 
and also articulation. It's one thing to be heard, but if you're uh, uh, if it's all just mush, they're not going to be able to understand you. So being able to train your mouth to articulate, to speak clearly so that everybody can hear is of paramount concern to the actor. And finally, the third tool of the actor is the mind. Now, you might think that sort of goes without saying that if, if you don't have a mind, <laughs> I guess you wouldn't be alive, so you couldn't be an actor. But um, it's important to consider this aspect of it because the mind is sort of the internal component here. How actors analyze the script and look at their character, how their character behaves, and how it engages your imagination. What if my character was like this? So if my character thinks like this and they encounter this situation, then what could I do to better show that? That's the mind side of the actor. So those three tools, body, voice, and mind, are important. Now, your book frames acting in two different ways, inside out versus outside in. Let's take a look. So inside out is probably the one that we're a little bit more familiar with. That's defined as starting with your mind, so that tool number three, right, your mind of an actor, and then creating the character using your body and voice, your other tools. So starting with the mind and then creating the character with the body and voice. So an example of this is an actor thinking, okay, what does this character want? What motivates this character? Starting with the thought first. The other way outside in acting is where you start with your body and your voice, those two tools, and then that informs your decision or your imagination, your mind. So body and voice and then to mind. An example of this is maybe first developing, how does this character move or speak? And then thinking, okay, well, if my character sort of moves and speaks like this, then what could they want? Or what are they doing, right? It leads to that mind-engaged tool, rather than the first two tools, body and voice being engaged first, and then leading that to the mind, okay? So that's inside the mind to outside the body and voice, or outside the body and voice, inside to the mind, when we talk about these things. So inside out acting, we'll focus on first. That's probably most recognizable to us, uh, especially as Americans. And if we wanna know how Americans got this idea of inside out acting, we have to go to Russia, of course. So the man in the picture here is Konstantin Stanislavski. Sometimes you see his name spelled uh, a little bit differently than this um, because it's translated in different ways from the, the Russian Cyrillic alphabet. But he's credited for founding the Moscow Art Theater uh, around the turn of the century. Uh, Moscow Art Theater still in existence today uh, in Moscow, still producing uh, interesting, uh, innovative theater even today. Stanislavski started as an actor. He started doing sort of silly farces, things that he wasn't too satisfied with. He wanted something that was meaty. The theater in Russia was sort of stagnated doing these silly, silly farces. And he wanted something that was realistic, that you could sink your teeth into. So he developed a system for the actor that they could work from the inside out. So once again, starting with that mind and moving to the body and voice. Uh, Stanislavski's acting style is also credited with how we developed this idea of realism and even uh, delving into certain aspects of like psychology of character, the sort of psychoanalysis um, of the character being an important part uh, of the uh, actor's toolbox. That really its roots come from him. Uh, and, and later on, Sigmund, you know, Sigmund Freud and his idea of psychoanalysis and even sexual psychoanalysis um, come into uh, come into play there too, but uh, many times it's credited with Stanislavski as making that actionable for the actor. So we associate inside out acting and Stanislavski with representational style of acting, which means realistic realism. You got it. So Stanislavski's system, sometimes called the method or method acting, um, boils down to well. There's a lot of different points, but we're gonna focus on three for this course here. <clears throat> First is this creation of the idea of objectives for the character. That is simply goals that are important or vital for the character's actions, needs, desires, and state of mind. So what does your character want? 
is what Stanislavski would ask, ask his actors, or when he acted as well, he would ask himself, what does my character want here? What are my goals here as this character? What do I want the other characters to give me to be satisfied, for my character to be satisfied? So that's one part of it. The second thing is the obstacle. So now what stands in that way? If, uh, for example, I want something and uh, then I say, hey, give me that. And then the other character gives it to me, then it's over. I've achieved my objective, right? But remember when we talked about plot and conflict being the soul of the play and conflict driving the plot, many times there's something that's stopping that thing, uh, that character from getting that thing that they want. So that Stanislavski defined as the obstacle. So that's something that the other characters do to stop the character in getting what they want. And when those things come into conflict, then you have, uh, well, conflict. Great job, Dr. Witt, you just said that. That's the third issue that we're talking about here. So how do characters with opposing objectives work through these obstacles to get what they want, to achieve their objectives? There's many ways of doing that. And as an actor, an inside out actor, an actor trained in the uh, in the R, the realistic or representational style of acting, you would have a certain way of approaching uh, answering this question in terms of your performance. So another way that the actors can connect to their characters using the inside out method is through using all the memories. Not all the memories, just two memories your book talks about. One is the sense memory. So that's pretty simple. You can think of the five senses and engaging those. So that's smell, touch, taste, etc. Think of this image of someone smelling a flower. Sense memory. The other memory is known as affective memory. And that's more remembering your past or bringing personal experience forward into the acting space when you're performing as an actor. This image here is maybe of a time if you needed to play maybe a sad person on stage, but you yourself were not sad, then maybe you would engage with the memory of a time when, you know, you, you had to say goodbye to your dog or you had to put your dog to sleep because they were very sick or something like that. That's a sad time that might bring you down. And you can use that when you play that character who is sad at that moment on stage. So we're going to talk a little bit about a little bit more about both of these types of memories going forward. Sense memory. Sense memory is defined as utilizing sensory memories to realize a moment on stage. So sensory memories to realize a moment on stage. How might that be applicable? How might an actor apply that? Let's see. So for example, my character has to drink coffee on stage, but there's only water in my coffee mug. So I can remember the feeling of holding a warm mug of coffee, how it feels like, how it smells, the sort of bitterness uh, in it as it drinks, and, and then it maybe helps you come back to that memory. You can recreate that on stage, maybe subconsciously by engaging your mind, and then maybe subconsciously your voice and your body follows on that. So internal, inside to outside acting by thinking of that mug of coffee. Effective memory is a little bit different. <clears throat> we can define that as when someone is utilizing a memory that brings about an emotional response similar to the one called for in the script. So engaging this for an emotional response. How might we put that to use? Let's see. Now, if I'm playing Crane on Antigone, I may recall a time I had to make a difficult decision between two job offers, right? This might assist me in playing Creon <clears throat> as he decided what to do with Antigone after she had been caught. So if you have some problems relating as an actor, relating to what your character is doing, I've never been a Greek king who took over a country after a brutal civil war, and then this person who's... My son's fiance comes in and defies me in public and embarrasses me in front of everybody. That's never happened to me and probably never will. But I can think of something similar to that and connect that to what my character is going through on stage. And then once again, subconsciously, my mind might trick my body, my voice 
to following through on that emotion or the appearance of that emotion on stage in that circumstance. Make sense? So sense memory is your five senses, recreating that. And effective memory is bringing something emotionally from your past and putting it onto the stage in the present. Now, there's different ways that actors have been trained over the years. If we look at probably going back to antiquity until um, actually fairly recently, uh, actors have been trained on an apprentice model. So much like uh, if you were like a, like a goldsmith or a blacksmith or something, you would be apprenticed to a, a master smith and follow them and study what they do. And then eventually when you're good enough, you could go on your own and start your own little, your business up over there doing what your, your master had trained you to do. Much the same way for acting. Uh, a lot of times there were family models. Think back to those uh, female uh, actresses when they first emerged in the uh, European Renaissance. There was a family connection there. So many times the children of those people who are famous stars would continue on in the acting profession because that's what they had been grown up. Uh, that's what they've been trained up under. And when they came into their own, they just went professional themselves. However, actors were not as open in contrast to what's happening now. Actors were not as open about their craft. Nowadays, everything on YouTube is talking about this and behind the scenes that and whatever. Back in the day, that was trade secrets. That was like a magician guarding their tricks nowadays. When actors didn't want to talk about it. Yeah, just, you know, just watch the show and have the stage magic happen there. That was their bread and butter. So they didn't want to give away all their tricks by talking all about it. So if you apprenticed to an actor, it was a good thing. Oh, you got to hear all of the secret tricks, all the tricks of the trade um, <clears throat> that that actor might impart to you. And then you could use that to, uh, to professional success. However, in modern days, we have schools, much like this university that you are all attending and that I am part of. <laughs> Uh, we train actors here, pretty simply. But that history is actually fairly, not fairly long. I mean, if you look about 1850 is the first uh, sustained uh, uh, system of training actors. It goes back to the Frenchman, Francois de la Sarte, um, where you have the system of training actors. And <clears throat> in that one, uh, in that first system, much like today, you know, there's this idea of training the voice, training the body. Training the mind, those three tools of the actor. Nowadays, there's also modern actors who also train under that apprentice system. For example, Jackie Chan down here, uh, when he was being trained in uh, in Hong Kong, he was trained under a, uh, a Beijing opera master. Though he's in Hong Kong, he was trained in Beijing opera, which is like a thousand miles away from Hong Kong because there was a master from Beijing that had come to Hong Kong. And uh, him and a few other martial arts actors had uh, apprenticed under him for like 10, 20, 10, 10 to 15 years and then eventually made a transition to doing stunt work, martial arts stuff and, and, and film acting in, in these Hong Kong Kung Fu movies in the in the 70s and 80s. <clears throat> so in the modern era, there are apprenticeship models still, uh, many times in Eastern uh, arts as well. When we take a look at the arts of India, Japan and China, um, they embrace apprenticeship models, sort of master to student, one to one training rather than a, a school setting like we have usually in the West. So let's take a look about training for the body. Actors can employ many different ways here in the West, many different ways of training their body in order to be the most expressive, flexible, and um, limber as possible. Many actors uh, take courses in dance, both in styles of dance like ballet or tap or jazz. Uh, as well as sort of modern dance, just to help you sort of move around and express yourself. Stage movement is a class that many will take here if you're interested in acting. It gives you sort of a base level of uh, control and expression. At least that's what it seeks to do over the body. So there'll be techniques and flexibility and relaxation and breath control and looking into specifics of how characters are created through using that actor's tool of the body. Stage combat, hey, I teach stage combat. I got to plug that in there. But it's a specialized movement for something that can be especially dangerous and exciting on stage, like stage combat. Martial arts also historically uh, have been used to train actors. If you look at uh, some of the Indian acting traditions, they'll just do martial arts training. And then after that's done, they'll, they'll do their acting training. Uh, same in Japan as well. And even in the modern era, um, 
the Suzuki technique uh, in the theaters developed by a guy who took uh, a Japanese director who took inspiration from certain Japanese traditional martial arts, including sumo. So he has like his actors like stomp around the area as like sort of having this connection with the ground for them to build their characters off of. Yoga is increasingly important for flexibility, endurance, and breath control in actors. And uh, probably the most, uh, the hottest thing now for actor training is meditation. It's sort of a body practice that helps the breath or the voice and then also the mind. So it sort of combines all three of those tools of an actor. So I think in the future, you can watch for more uh, meditation things being applied and being become more of a, becoming more of a core part of actor training. That, that, that's my prediction. See if that comes true in 10 years. So we've talked about body training. Now let's talk about if the actor is fully trained if the actor is ready to make a physical choice using primarily their body, what are some ways that we can discuss that? So let's just be a little bit of a preview. If you watch something uh, on stage, the next time you watch something on stage, think about these physical uh, choices that the actors are making. First is posture. And that means, or we can, one way of looking at posture is what is leading when the actor is moving? What part of their body moves first? Leading with the head, you know, some people can move, oh, they're sort of scooping into you with your head. That's a character choice. Leading with the toe, maybe they sort of, maybe they're a little bit nervous, so they sort of stick their toe out first, and then they go, and then they walk like that. Another physical choice the actor can make. Think about as the actor's body is moving, how fast is it or how slow? That would convey certain character information, like perhaps age. You know, a little kid would run around really fast, but like an old man would just go really, really slow hoppling across the stage. That's the way the actor can use their body to portray those types of characters. Think about weight. And this doesn't mean like, you know, how many pounds the actor weighs, but how do they hold their body? Are they light on their toes? Are they, you know, jumping around and dancing around and look like they're going to be a, you know, eloquent swordsman? Ha ha, very quick. Or are they low? You know, maybe there's some, you know, person that's like you know doing a jackhammer and a construction worker all day so even though they're skinny as a rail they might you know carry themselves very low and very heavy or psychological burdens maybe there's an overworked mom so she's always like hunched over like this on stage because she has all the psychological demands of a whole family resting on her shoulders uh, think about motion as well. Are the characters the characters nervous perhaps their motions are more constrained they're keeping their body, keeping their hands and their feet close to their body because they're not in a comfortable location. Or maybe it's more free. They're happy to dance and jump around. If it's in the middle of a musical and they're singing for joy and jumping for joy, their emotions might be uh, coming into their body and it's allowing whew, it to fly out and express itself. Next, let's move on to voice training. Historically, the voice has had more prominence for the actor than the body. Can you imagine why? Think back to the Greek and Roman times. Remember they had full head mask, they had full body uh, costumes, and even with those elevator sandals. So the body was not seen too much. The face was completely obscured for all the Greek time period and all the Roman time period. So historically it's been the voice to make sure that it gets out there to everybody. There are different ways of teaching uh, different vocal um, techniques. One is the Alexander Technique. Uh, on campus here at this institution, we have an Alexander Technique certified teacher to help improve breath control <clears throat> and the actor's voice. This can also be used for musicians, um, even, even musicians that don't um, play uh, wind instruments or instruments that require breath, like even for violinists, because they are gonna breathe when they perform. So if you can settle into a good relaxed position that allows breath to flow easily, that can improve your performance, even if you're not blown into a big old tuba or something like that. Singing, of course, musical actors and, uh, you know, Broadway musical theater actors, uh, as well as the ancient Greeks and Romans who likely sung most or all of those plays. Projection and articulation, we talked about before, having your voice reach those people in the back and also be clear enough so they can understand it was a primary goal of the ancient actor. One of those tools also that many modern actors are trained in is known as the International Phonetic Alphabet. 
you've probably seen this without noticing it. It's the way that um, they write the words here so that it can be easily pronounced. For example, introduction on the left side here, on the right side in gray is an example of the International Phonetic Alphabet. It's a way of breaking down each word sound, each word into a series of sounds that can be objectively studied. This is used a lot of times in accent uh, acquisition. If I'm playing an Irish character, they pronounce words differently maybe. So you can use IPA to change the text into sounds and then the actor can replicate those sounds to have a convincing accent for another character. So it leads us to vocal choices. For an actor's vocal choices, we can think about these things um, when they make them. See if you can identify some of these. The pitch of their voice, very high or very low, can tell about character. Same with the speed. Do they talk fast? Do they talk slow? Maybe that betrays youth or excitement or age, right? depending on the rate of speech. How about the rhythm? Are they super smooth and suave and, you know, don't have a care in the world, rich little playboy guy? Or is it choppy and quick? Maybe you're very nervous. Um, some little mousy, you know, computer nerd. Uh, well, actually, yeah, yeah, and yeah, you're always interrupting yourself or something like that. How about accent? Is there a regional accent? If you're from the American South, uh, you might speak a little bit different than if you're from, uh, you know, Brooklyn, New York. So it'd be quite different. Uh, sometimes the actors have to modify how they naturally sound to play a convincing character. Also a language accent. If you're a native Russian speaker or native uh, Swahili speaker, and you're now speaking in English, you know, maybe you need to add an accent, a flavor of that language onto the English accent that you're, onto the English that you're speaking. Right, so next is a video of Judy Dench. I want you to consider what the vocal choices are based on what we talked about that Judy Dench has made. Judy Dench is the, the lady on the left here. Now I'll put the link to this video in the description below this video here. So <clears throat> I'm not going to play it now. All right, moving on. All that was inside out acting. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about outside in acting. Whoa. So remember, that's body and voice informing the mind. The example that your book points to, and that I think uh, is probably the most illustrative of this as a contemporary American performing artist, is Anna DeVere Smith. Anna DeVere Smith's style is that she takes a outside-in approach to her roles. When she'll go and research something and interview a lot of people, usually around one event or one theme, She'll interview a lot of people, type up those interviews and watch them as they say them and use every word that those real people say about this real event. She will imitate that. So completely external, looking at their body, looking at their voice and copying all of that as much as she can and then performing the words exactly as those real people said them. So an outside in acting style. She's not thinking, okay, I'm, I'm this person and like he's a cowboy, so we'll sort of be like, oh, I'm a cowboy. She just takes a look at what the actual cowboy says and what the actual cowboy is moving, their body and their voice, and then imitates that. Some of her most famous works are Fires in the Mirror, and um, that was nominated for a Pulitzer, where she <clears throat> did this technique. And in fact, there was controversy because you said you didn't write anything for this play. You went and interviewed people and copied them. That's not really being a playwright, is it? You're just sort of a documentary theater artist. But I mean, she won a Pulitzer Prize for that. It was considered great literature and a great performance that she did where she embodied all these different characters surrounding one particular issue. Twilight Los Angeles was another one that she did as well. They're great examples. If you ever see a production of that or can still see the film productions of that, I would, uh, I would highly recommend it. So next, we're going to take a look at Anna DeVere Smith for a few minutes in one of her newer projects called Let Me Down Easy, which is um, I think focused around a lot of characters who are looking at uh, dealing with cancer diagnoses and how that affects them and their life. So these are all real people she travels and interviews to and then copies everything that they do and puts it into a, a work of art. So this video will be down in the description below. Uh, please take a look at it. I think it's about three minutes or so. 
She plays many different characters. How do her vocal choices and physical choices change between each character? The last part of this chapter talks about the actor's rehearsal processes. It's sort of a just a general overview uh, if you're not familiar with how a modern day American actor, uh, the steps they will go through in a typical theatrical production. Usually the actor will start reading through the script where everybody comes together and they read through the script one time. That will be followed by table work with the director and all the actors will sit in a room and discuss different aspects of the show itself. Next will be blocking. We'll talk a little bit more about this when we talk about the director. <clears throat> but blocking is an important part of the show. Is Yeah, where the director will tell the actor how to move around the stage in what manner and set the different ways the actor enters and exits the stage as well as different mannerisms that the director and the actor can collaborate on in playing the character. And if we take a look at the next part, uh, the next type of rehearsal will be running, where they'll just run the show and work on the bits that aren't quite working. Uh, followed by the technical rehearsal, where all the technical elements, costumes, lighting, all that stuff comes together. And finally, dress rehearsal, which is everything as if it were a live performance, but the audience is not there. So everything is working together. Finally, if it's a bigger show, sometimes you'll have a preview. So before it opens, you'll have sometimes invited guests or members of the press will come and watch a show before it opens. Sometimes it can be a long period for Broadway shows. The Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark famously had a preview period, the longest preview period <clears throat> in Broadway history, which is over a year long. And finally, performance. The show officially opens, tickets are sold, the audience comes in, and the performances uh, occur. Now, your book has some perhaps a little bit outdated information about the modern professional actor. But one part that is in date is that in the United States, the Actors' Equity Association is the union for stage actors. Um, it's abbreviated as AEA or sometimes equity. You can see the symbol um, down there. And uh, it's extending now to film, TV, radio, and the internet uh, in certain aspects. Um, there's other ones for film. There's SAG-AFTRA. Uh, for these these other actors unions as well, but equity still primarily represents actors on the uh, on the stage. If you want to be an actor these days, you got to do a lot of self promotion, social media stuff, um, as well as just word of mouth and keeping keeping your contacts fresh in the industry. Uh, you don't get too much money as an actor. The vast majority of actors don't get too much money. Some well known actors get millions of dollars for each production or whatever that they're in, but. <clears throat> not so much here and certainly not on the stage. It doesn't make too much money. And it's quite unstable. Usually once one job is over, that's it. You're back back to looking for more work, back to auditioning. Uh, your book lists this figure from the 2009 to 2010. It's a little bit dated now, but equity actors. So that means professional actors or actors that are good enough and are committed enough to acting to have uh, paid money to join the union those people have about a 60% unemployment rate uh, in that year. So it's a, uh, it's a trying profession to be in as a professional actor. So that leads us to our acting project information. Now I've posted this on, D, on uh, our Brightspace, yes. And we'll go over this in class on Thursday, hopefully if I feel well enough. Um, but it's due next week. It'll be 75 points, and it's the first of our series of three projects, sorry, of four projects where you get to uh, take on the role of a theater artist. So in this one, we'll start off with being an actor. <clears throat> so we just talked about inside out and outside in acting. And for this one, you'll begin by reading She Kills Monsters, which you're already going to do, and then select one of these characters, and you can ask these questions as if you're beginning to play the character. So as if you're an actor preparing to play this character, right? You can submit the assignment on Brightspace, hopefully before class, uh, on the 20th. And the project is worth 75 points. So these uh, three questions from the inside out style of acting, and these two questions from the outside in style of acting. 
um, are what you need to answer. As if you're going to play one of these characters, Lilith, Orcus, Calliope, Chuck, Tilly, or Agnes. Uh, we'll go over these, and if you have any questions, you can ask me in class. All right, that's it for next time. So read She Kills Monsters, do the quiz before class because we're going to have our discussion in class on Thursday. <clears throat> also, you need to have read She Kills Monsters in order to do the acting project. So doubly important to read that play. And after you finish She Kills Monsters, you can go ahead and get started on the acting project. If you have any questions, you can email me a rough draft or email me those questions about that particular project. All right, hopefully I'll feel well enough to be... Uh, with you on uh, on Thursday. But uh, anyway, I enjoyed uh, recording this video lecture and uh, hopefully I'll see you in class. Bye.